Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I want to welcome you to the Green Dialogue, and thanks for coming. We're once a month we uh, we have a special speaker to talk about a topic of interest. And thank you, Emma Campbell, for joining us. We always learn something when you're here. And uh, we're going to record this meeting so that if others would like to check it out. Um, but I'll before <clears throat> without further ado, I'll let Emma get started. And um, thanks, thanks again, everyone, for being here. Emma, great, hey, take I'm it gonna, away. Yeah, I'm gonna share my screen. Thanks for having me on this morning. I'm really excited to talk about native plants and all their glory. <laughs> Let me just get into power to slideshow view here. Is everyone seeing uh, this load right now? Yeah, try double clicking that presentation. Um, or I had some challenges with my slideshow as well. Right now it's just a loading icon. Okay. Oh, oh, there we go. Sweet. Great. Okay. I just need to minimize my bar here. So Perfect. Okay, so thank you again for having me. Um, my name is Emma Campbell. I'm the Land Stewardship Coordinator uh, for Meridian Township. And today I'm going to talk about the environmental benefits of planting native species and how that can restore uh, nature into our community. So before we uh, talk about how exactly to bring those plants into our yards, we really need to talk about what a native plant is as well as why they matter and what is currently threatening them right now. So a native plant is one that has occurred in our particular region or ecosystem for a really long time um, without any human introduction. So we're gonna talk a little bit about invasive species. Which someone, oh, there you go. <laughs> Uh, we're going to talk about invasive species as well, which are non-native plants that have been introduced um, through humans. And some of those non-native plants can really cause a lot of issues. So these plants have been around for a really long time. They've evolved for thousands to millions of years with our local insect population and our wildlife. Um, I like to show this picture because these two species have been with each other for over 300 million years. Um, the dragonfly that's pictured here is not specialized to this plant, which is ca called scouring rush, or sometimes people call it horsetail or snake grass. Um, but they have known each other for millions of years. Um, so imagine knowing a friend or a sibling for that long, and you develop this really intimate relationship with them. So that's what a native plant is. And you know, why should we care about native plants? What's the big deal about integrating them into our yards? Um, so every animal and person on the planet, whether you're vegan, vegetarian, and omnivore, we all get our energy either indirectly or directly from plants. So plants have this amazing quality to take uh, the sun and turn it into energy, and we all benefit from that. Um, so they're very important in that aspect. <laughs> and when we're talking about native plants specifically, uh, our food webs, um, you might have learned about food chains or food pyramid in school. And now we really know that it's a web. They, they don't usually go in one direction, they go in a lot of directions. And our native plants are the center of those food webs and everything around it has a very specific relationship that's evolved around that plant. So if we take out one plant in an ecosystem, say an oak, um, an oak species are a native tree and they have over 400 different caterpillar species that can feed on them or host on them. So they're very important species. And if we took all of those out of one area, then we would lose a lot of steps in our food web because then our caterpillars wouldn't have anything to feed on. Um, so you're going to hear me talk a lot about insects and their relationship with plants. And maybe you're not so keen on insects. Maybe you love insects. Um, no matter how you do feel about them, uh, they're very important. Uh, both plants and insects kind of make up 
the bottom of that uh, food web, uh, but it doesn't make them any less important. It actually makes them extremely important. Um, so, you know, I have a statistic here from Autobahn where 96% of terrestrial birds rear their young on insects. Uh, so right there, we can see how important insects really are. Um, I think I read that it takes 16,000 insects to raise one chickadee family. <laughs> so they are very important and they depend a lot on plants. Um, we're going to talk about something that's really threatening native plant species, and that is urbanization. And um, we've really uh, used agriculture and our urban sprawl to take over a lot of land. Um, and when we do end up um, taking over that land for agriculture or urbanization, we end up usually creating a pretty homogenized area. So a lot of times, you know, only one type of plant is, is planted in a farm crop. And so we're gonna kind of talk about why that's a big threat to native plants. But they do provide a lot of um, ecosystem services in addition to us depending on them for food. Um, they increase biodiversity in an area which is very important. Um, we can think of a very classic example of, you know, if we only have one species in an area, you know, let's say an agricultural crop and a disease comes in and it does affect that plant, then that whole area is just knocked out. But if we had a hundred species in an area and a disease comes in, it might only affect five or 10 of those species. Even if it affects up to 50 of them, we still have 50 species left that are gonna still, you know, reside in that ecosystem and grow and take care and help it bounce back. So that's really important. Um, native plants also sequester carbon and help keep our cities cooler. And of course, all plants do this, um, but native plants have so many other local benefits um, that this is just a you know, cherry on top. And we really need to think about that as we give off a lot more carbon uh, into our atmosphere and we're going through a lot of warming. So we, we really need to keep that in mind and, and that superpower that plants have. Um, they also filter uh, groundwater, and which is very important in Michigan because a lot of Michiganders uh, drink groundwater. I do. <laughs> and that kind of goes back to how they help our cities. You know, our cities are made up of a lot of concrete, and concrete uh, absorbs heat, which is what makes them hotter, and it also allows water to run straight off of it. And it carries with it pollution, um, you know, chemicals, sediment. And when we, you know, cover our land with more plants, uh, that's really going to help protect our watersheds uh, from all that runoff. It's kind of this whole cascade um, effect. This is a great picture that's just a really cool example of um, why plants help with that runoff. Um, also, we don't really think a lot about below the surface what's going on. And we don't think about all the soil microorganisms, the fungi, all the insects that reside in the soil that are also really important to our ecosystems. And over here, we have a standard turf that a lot of us use for our lawns. And I think this is Kentucky bluegrass specifically. And we can see how short the root system is there. And then all these other plants are native species. And you can just see the great variety, their different shapes, their different lengths. But the big point to drive home here is that their root systems are so extensive and go so deep. And that's just gonna benefit so much below, below the soil surface. So now we're gonna kind of talk about, you know, what are these threats to native plants? And something, a plant that I deal with a lot, uh, plants are invasive species, which we kind of talked about are non-native, but they end up causing um, uh, ecological, economic, or human harm because they are so insane and take over. So we can see how they can just, this is oriental bittersweet, it's blanketing this forest. Um, and so those are a huge threat. And the reason I want to talk about them is because most of them are plants that we plant in our yards and we landscape with them. So invasive species were introduced because we wanted to use them for their foliage, for how hardy they are, um, because they can take over so well, they're easy to grow. So it's really important when we're thinking about native gardening 
uh, to think about invasive species. So this is an oak I'm taking care of in Nancy Moore Park that has oriental bittersweet just really taking over. And like we talked about, oaks are very important and overall they support over 4,000 organisms. So many things feed on oaks and use oaks as a host uh, tree. So something very important to think about with native gardening. Um, another big threat to native, to our native habitats is habitat fragmentation. And, you know, I talked a little bit about that as we build houses and roads, um, we're kind of chopping up the land. And it's just really interesting to think about, you know, when we look at this picture on the left, um, we have more diversity of species because simply put, some species just need a lot more room to roam. They need longer tracts of land to get the food that they need. Um, a really good example to think about is I live over by Waldemar in South Lansing, which has a really beautiful beech maple forest that once extended all the way over here to Okemos and beyond. So we kind of forget that at one time this was all a big tract of mixed deciduous forest that we have kind of chopped up over time. So every time we do that, we lose those um, species that need a, a large range. And um, that's also kind of when we get some of our pesty species, like <laughs> our deer get out of control, our rabbits get out of control, that sort of thing. Um, so that's a really big threat to native ecosystems. So here's what you can do to combat all of that. Um, it's, it's a long road, but it's certainly something we can all, uh, if we all help out, it's gonna make a huge difference. So I'm using our wonderful uh, hidden garden roundabout as an example. Um, I think a lot of times when we think about native gardening, some of us might get overwhelmed and we don't wanna start over or it, it can be a lot. You know, We wanna do it really big and we wanna do it perfect. But the biggest thing is, is small can make such a huge difference. So every single native plant that you introduce to your yard is gonna make a difference. And this garden is a perfect example of that. So it's just a roundabout in the middle of a roundabout <laughs> with the garden. There's cars whirring around it. So you might think that you're not gonna find anything here, but if we take a look at this next slide and we look closer, these were actually taken at the Hidden Garden uh, last summer. And some of you I'm sure are very familiar with this little critter, uh, Monarch uh, Caterpillar. And they are a specialized insect. So they feed specifically on milkweed. They complete their whole life cycle on milkweed. Um, and we've heard a lot about them in the past few years. So because we have um, this great butterfly weed in the garden, we've got monarch butterflies. Also over here, we've got an admiral uh, butterfly, which the larva doesn't feed on coneflower, but the adults pictured here, they love the nectar. So. Again, small can make a big difference. So how do we bring native species into our yard? So I'm gonna start with a very easy, inexpensive way um, just to see what's going on. Like I said, some of us are on land that was once an old growth forest. So you never know what's gonna be in the seed bank. So simply an inexpensive path to take is just to hold off using pesticide if you do and raise up your mower deck. Uh, the DNR recommends four inches and that can help a lot of little tiny flowers grow. Like I have a lot of Canada violet that grows in my lawn. And when I mow at four inches, it stays safe and it gets to grow. So this is a picture at my house. When I moved in three years ago, uh, my land was very highly managed. There was a lot of pesticide use. And this is about a year after I moved in and I stopped using all pesticide. And I started having common milkweed pop up by my fence and it's beautiful and a lot of monarchs come to it and I love it. This is not a picture from my friend's yard specifically, but uh, I went over, a lot of my friends have me come over and, and see if they have invasives and that sort of thing. And she had wild blue phlox growing, which is a really beautiful spring woodland plant that's not very common anymore. And it was just popping up in her yard. So I said, absolutely keep that, love it, nurture it. Uh, this is from Ferguson Park in the township. Uh, this area was too wet to mow because it was by the river. And I found a bunch of swamp milkweed 
popping up, which is a much more rare milkweed and it's a very beneficial plant. So simply put, you can just see what comes naturally and uh, nurture the heck out of it once you get it. <laughs> this is another plant in my yard. This is fleabane. It just looks like it's closed in this picture, but once it blooms, it looks like little tiny daisies. It's a great uh, seed producer and it just popped up next to my gutter. And you know, some people might not enjoy this look. I do, I like that kind of wild uh, look and I love it. And a lot of pollinators, um, insects will be on it all day and I know it will grow there. So I let it go and it's a native species. Here's a tulip tree that my neighbor has a tulip tree and it started growing in my yard and I just let it go. They are a great host tree for uh, different butterfly species and I think they're very beautiful. So that's a good way to just kind of let it take its course, but I also have brought native plants into my yard specifically with a lot of intention. I've been planting a lot of native species. So this, I like this picture, the first one that came up because you can see that not everything is native in there. Um, I have some bergamot here in coneflower, but these are also what are called cultivars. Now cultivars are just a clone of a plant. So the best way to go native is to go to local nurseries, which I have a ton of resources that Leroy can send out uh, the PowerPoint. Um, but it's really nice to get native plants that are grown from local genotypes because they are evolved with insects in this area specifically instead of just being a clone of one plant. Uh, they kind of lose their genetic diversity when that happens. So, but that's okay. Sometimes you just see a pretty flower and it's at the you know nursery and you pick it up. I've got lavender growing here. I have a tea garden and an herb garden and a vegetable garden. So not everything has to be perfectly native, just make sure it's not invasive. Um, these are a lot of plants that I got from Designs by Nature and Wild Type. And I planted them last year and this year they're all huge and very prolific and flowering like crazy. And the, the biggest thing too is try to look for plants that bloom at all times of the year. So this is New England Aster and it'll be bloomed until October, but it doesn't start till about August or September. So it's a great plant for late pollinators who are migrating or about to lay eggs for the end of the season or go dormant. Um, this year too, I also put in a four by 10 uh, garden. Uh, you can buy a flat of 38 plants from Designs by Nature. A uh, wild type uh, sells big flats too. And he'll give you a design plan and everything so that you can just read it and pop them in the ground. and. I just planted this year and it's already huge and my vervain is blooming already and my spider wart. So uh, they go really quickly once they're happy. <laughs> so I put this together. Um, these are just stock photos of all the species I planted, but this is what it will look like if everything goes well, which so far it is. And you can see he, he adds a lot of color he makes it very diverse. He gives you different heights. Um, so it's a really easy, great way to start out native gardening. If you're like, I don't know anything and I just want somebody to tell me what to do, it's great. So those are really good ways to bring native species into your yard. And it, you know, like I said, sometimes you plant them and it goes really well um, and it's easy. Um, but you know, of course, the first couple of years, you're gonna to have to do weeding, you're gonna to have to water them. But once those plants, those native plants are established, it is no maintenance at all. And I love it because I don't have a lot of time to get in my garden all, all through the summer. Um, but really, you know, that's all great and good. But the most important thing that I want everyone today to think about is what plants are my local nursery selling? Like this is, I have listed a list from a local nursery that I love and I've been going there forever. But I was so sad when I saw um, these plants listed that are circled uh, because these are all invasive species that I remove. I've put in countless hours removing these from local forests. And it's just really disheartening to see that places are still selling them. Um, 
So really just do your research. I I'm a great resource. I can talk all day about this kind of stuff. So if you ever have questions, you can always email me. I'll put my contact info in the chat and ask me about anything uh, invasive or native. Um, because you know there's a difference, like we said, with non-native and invasive, where these are plants that they are going to escape. They are going to get into our local natural areas. It's just inevitable and it's going to happen. And then someone like me is going to spend a lot of their time removing these to try to restore local native populations. So it's just really important. I want everyone to know that periwinkle or vinca, I remove a lot of that. And it used to not be seen in natural areas as much, but now it's really taking over. Um, so just really think about, you know, if it has um, Japanese, European, Russian, uh, Oriental in the name, it's just really good to research it because, you know, generally if it has that in the name, you know, it's coming from a different country. So I did include a list of the plants, you know, that I have planted in my yard. A lot of these are very sun loving. Uh, you can do sh native shade plants. Um, the nurseries that I listed and that um, you're going to get a resource on are, they have all kinds of great stuff. They've got shrubs and trees. Um, in fact, in my tea garden, I was able to put in New Jersey tea, which is a native bush that I can use for tea. So there's a lot of options out there. And again, you can just start simply, start with one or two species, see how it goes. Um, you don't have to you know, go big or go home. So any little bit is, is really gonna be beneficial. And these are my resources. Uh, Bringing Nature Home by Douglas Tallamy is an incredible read. And he, just watching his YouTube videos, he's amazing. The Michigan Natural Features Inventory is a great way to get familiar with native plants in your area. Uh, Michigan Flora, uh, the National Wildlife Federation, they have a great plan. You can put in your zip code and they'll give you a plan of what to start planting, what to start thinking about. Um, and then, you know, you'll receive this information, but the Wild Ones Red Cedar chapter has all of the local nurseries listed. Um, and here's an example of some, but Michigan Wildflower Farm, um, does a great job with seed mixes. So I'm actually gonna kill off a good portion of my grass this year, and I'm gonna get a seed mix from them and put in a prairie. So uh, they're really good for that. And wild type and designs by nature are great for flats and plugs. And then this is just some general information about the Meridian Conservation Corps. And if you do want to get involved locally to help get rid of invasive plants, which really you know, threaten our native species. Or if you just want to come out with us, we, I have an ecologist I work with who we always learn a new plant, a new native plant when we go out with him. So it's just a great way to get familiar with your local natural areas and get outside. All right, I don't know how to stop. Sh oh, here we go. <laughs> So if anyone has any questions, I'm going to put my contact information in the chat. That's fantastic, Emma. Thank you so much. How about a round of applause for... Uh... Thank you. <laughs> I hope I didn't talk too fast. <laughs> um, of course, we, we open it up to, to questions and, uh, and conversation. Um, so this is uh, for the next uh, 40, half hour or so. So go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Cecilia. Yeah. Th thank you, Emma. That was a marvelous, um, marvelous uh, introduction to that whole concept of uh, returning things to uh, native uh, plants. I just let my garden go wild and there it is. Um, <laughs> not necessarily the way I want it to look. But <laughs> yeah, I I'm hear that. <laughs> I'm surprised you did not uh, talk about um, another native uh, uh, planting area. Um, and I would suggest that everybody just go to their local library, the Okemos Library, um, and not go inside to books. No, stay outside around the perimeter of the library. The librarian has worked uh, very hard to return 
uh, uh, the area the, between the, gar the walkway and the building to uh, native plants. And it's worked very well. Um, I wanna, sh I'll see if I can find it real fast. There was a, um, uh, a visitor this week at the, uh, at the library. Can y'all see that? That oh, is beautiful. That is, that is it's, it's like four inches across. It was enormous. I've never seen I butterfly. It is a moth. Apparently it's called an imperial moth. I've never seen anything this big. It's like a B-52 compared to a monarch butterfly. I've never seen anything that big. It's huge, but it was a pair of drying its wings um, on the door of the library because of the rain that had been coming down. So um, the garden that, that uh, uh, Betsy Hull has, has planted and has been fostering for a couple of years now is really paying off big benefits. So yes, when you go to the library, take a moment, walk around the outside there and take a look at the, uh, at the plantings. Thanks for mentioning that. I actually have not been over there there's a lot of places in the township that I haven't gotten out to, and that's that's really great and a great example. Um, that's something I didn't talk about is after being at my house for three years and letting all those plants come in and planting native, my yard is just full of dragonflies and moths and butterflies and different uh, sweat bees and honeybees. Um, so it really can make a huge difference. And it's actually National Moth Week, so it's really cool that you brought that up too. <laughs> but yeah, we're, you know, one of the things we wanna do with planting a native meridian is highlighting local native gardens that people can, you know, recognizing them. So people who are aspiring to plant native can go take a look at these places and really see, you know, the long-term effect of it and what it can look like. Briefly, uh, we, are, we are hoping to do a sustainable home and business tour on October 2nd. So we're looking for places like that um, where people can visit. Uh, we're gonna be focusing on a virtual tour, but if you have other suggestions, um, John Sarver um, has sort of let us evolve this from the Sol National Solar Home Tour to a more sustainable focus. So think about that. What other questions uh, do people have? I'm wondering about the uh, uh, grasses. You know, I've got planted some Carl Forrester and thinking about switchgrass. Are, are those uh, native or not? That's a great question, John. And, and, you know, of course, this is a really big topic to tackle in the short amount of time. So, of course, if anyone wants to continue this conversation ever, like I said, reach out to me. Um, switchgrass is native. And it's... Um, Native grasses are a huge thing that we all need to learn a little more about because a lot of us use ornamental grasses, um, which, you know, Phragmites was once an ornamental grass and now it's one of the worst things that we have to deal with in our state. Um, so yeah, that's a great idea. Um, if you're looking for uh, grasses to integrate even into your lawn to not mow, there's a lot of really neat um, no mow mixes where you're using fescues or um, even sedges. Now sedges are a little more expensive. It's more expensive to go native with all of that. Um, but even on Amazon, you can buy a fescue mix and fescues are, are not invasive. Uh, they're not all entirely native, uh, but you also have to think about the benefit of not mowing. And so those get about eight inches, but they roll over. They're a very flowy, soft looking grass. Um, so you know, if you're thinking too about integrating that sort of thing into your lawn. Um, but yeah, switchgrass is, is native. Well, part of it is the idea of, because uh, we talked previously about, uh, uh, you know, standing water and, and uh, I was told switchgrass might be good for kind of uh, uh, certainly, you know, slurping up a lot of water. Uh, but also I, I read somewhere that daylilies are good at kind of using up a lot of water. Is, is our daylilies a native plant too or not? So unfortunately, because <laughs> I have some daylilies in my yard that I really love the colors, um, but unfortunately they're not. And there is actually a few species that have become invasive. Um, but uh, switchgrass, it, it actually switchgrass was one of those pictured in that that 
root picture I showed um, that has a really extensive root system. So that one is really great for soaking up water. Really any of those that I pictured because of their root systems are so extensive, they can really soak up a lot of water and help with that issue. Actually, um, Valerie's on here. She's been helping out a lot at Marshall Park, but if you know Marshall Park, it's basically a big empty lawn. And it's been an issue for our grounds crew in mowing because it gets very wet every spring and fall. And so we're looking into um, planting a meadow of native grasses and forbs, so wildflowers. Um, and to try, to try to mitigate that, you know, not mowing a wet area and also being able to, to act as a little sink for all that water. Um, so it's not just a mud pile. Those are good things to think about. Uh, uh, Emma, can so. you tell me how one gets started? I have a large area of um, ground that is covered and it is, I don't know if it is invasive. Um, I can't even identify it. There's so many different species out there, but um, I can't get rid of it. And I would re really like to plant natives. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, if you ever too want to send me a picture of what it looks like, um, I have something in my lawn called Creeping Charlie that is totally taking over. It's a mint. Um, so that can be really frustrating. Um, but there, depending on how large the area is, um, if you're doing a smaller area, you know, you can kill the grass using cardboard or tarps. Um, if, it's, if it's a large area, um, you can just kind of ground zero it with herbicide. And I know not everybody's on board with using herbicide. Um, Vern Stevens at Designs by Nature, when he's doing a prairie restoration, we use herbicide and we just we kill everything um, that's invasive. You know, I mean, cause that's in those areas where we're trying to do that restoration, there's really nothing valuable there. If there was something, we wouldn't spray it. Um, so you can kill it with herbicide as well. And then once it's died back, um, you can, like for example, I'm gonna rent out a rototiller and I'm actually gonna till up the ground, but you can also just spread seed. Um, native seed, like I said, Michigan Wildflower Farm is great for seeds if it's a larger area and they will come in, um, but you'll still have to, you know, the thing with weeds or invasive species, I should say, is they will come back. <laughs> They're really hardy, but as long as you're staying pretty vigilant on everything and once a native population is established, um, it becomes a lot easier. But if it is a smaller area, if it's doable, you, transplants are great because you know they're mostly going to make it um, and they're going to fill in really nicely. Um, so yeah, definitely reach out to me. I'd love to help you with that journey. Um, we're really, right now, me and my intern are working on a native plant database and a resource for the township website to get people, just like you're saying, get them started get them on the track that they want to be with their native landscaping. And I'd also suggest um, Hazlitt Community Church for a um, part of that tour. We have a great um, memorial garden that is all um, native species. Uh, Sally Garrett is very um, involved in that and she works a lot with Vern. Yeah, Vern's a great, great resource. He knows a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. I have, I have a question about when you say that they are, once you get all these plantings in, you don't have to do anything with them and that kind of thing. What happens at the end of the season when it comes winter time and you've got all these plants that have grown? Do you not have to cut them off and then they are totally fine the next spring when everything starts growing again? How do, how do you deal with that? That's a really great question and it has a lot of there's a lot of interesting things that can go on with what you're talking about. So um, first off, throughout the summer, I cut a lot of my flowers um, because, I mean, you get a bouquet out of it and it does help them keep growing. A lot of um, native flower species can be really prolific and they'll grow even more. Like cone flowers, if you cut them back, they'll grow like crazy. Um, at the end of the season, what I do is I personally, I leave everything up because 
it turns out to be an incredible way for um, insects to overwinter. And so I like to leave all of the dead heads, um, the seed heads. I do take, I do cut quite a few of them because I like to harvest seeds. Um, the great thing about starting a native garden is once you have it, you can collect seeds in the fall and process them through the winter. And then you can make your own transplants for the next year and you don't have to buy anymore, you know, unless you want a new species. Um, so I'll cut some seed heads off, but otherwise I leave all of the, the dead material because I know that, um, you know, butterfly and moth species cocoon, some of them cocoon in overwinter, like polyphemus moths uh, overwinter and luna moths. Um, so I leave all that stuff up and then I cut it in the spring once it's warm enough and I know things are starting to kind of come back and wake up a little bit and then I'll cut everything back down to the ground uh, to where it's green. Um, you can absolutely cut everything in the fall if you'd like to and it's not going to affect them. They're going to come back even bigger uh, the next year. Of course, every species is different. So you know, we all have a, a great way to research everything nowadays. So it's really good to, to just see what's best for the specific species. Uh, but my stuff, I just cut it back and it's very hardy. And um, like my Coreopsis came back huge this year. I actually had to cut some of it out because it came back so big. Um, so it does depend on the species. Okay, thank you. It, it also is, um, uh, the seeds are bird seed right food for the for the birds too so they can eat yeah yeah absolutely good point yeah they uh are co they cover all, even the stuff that i have a gravel driveway and even the little low growing um i think i've got like uh purslane and different clovers that just pop up and even the little seeds i have uh white crowned and rust crowned sparrows that come and they eat all of it in the driveway so even that little stuff that you're not thinking about, they they will use it. <laughs> Do native species need um, soil enhancers, you know? Um... That's a great question. Um, they, they don't, um, it also depends on your soil. A really great thing to do is to get a soil test done. I planted a ton of stuff before I ever even did that. <laughs> And so it is really nice to know what your soil makeup is so that, you know, are they gonna, they, are they gonna make it? You know, some of them are more of a prairie species so they can take a sandier, drier soil. Um, some of them like great lobelia and vervain are more of a wetland species. And so like mine are growing even though they're not planted in a wetland, but I do um, water when it gets really dry. And I will give them some nutrients like just a couple of weeks ago, I gave the babies I planted some nutrients just to give them a little boost and to make them grow a little better, but they certainly don't need it um, because a lot of them are really adapted to, um, you know, natural conditions, which can be very variable. Um, if you are, if you do decide to look into like native woodland species that are shadier, those are going to be a little pickier because those are evolved to grow in a rich mixed deciduous forest. So they can be pickier for sure. Um, so again, it's very plant species specific. Um, it doesn't hurt to give them a little boost. You know, it's just like us. If we take a vitamin, you know, we feel better. <laughs> so. I think Kendra had a question. Thanks, LeRae. Emma. As always, fantastic and excellent. <laughs> always <laughs> love um, so I, a couple of questions. I was wondering, um, and I know this is probably another project for you, but um, can you teach us how to harvest the seeds? You know, like how to how to do that, and like when? I mean, not you know whenever that makes sense. And let me um, when you say like you cut a little of them, like Dad had some of them, so they'll grow more. Like, is there specific plants you do that for, or for all of them, like, can you help me with those questions, please? Yeah, yeah, so um, there's, like in my garden, I have a wild columbine that grows, but I also have a sand coreopsis and pale purple coneflower, gray coneflower. Um, I have nodding onion. And so 
my nodding onion and my columbine are not these species like coneflower you plant it and it's going to grow like crazy and it's going to be huge and it's going to just take care of itself the species like the nodding onion and the columbine are a little more contained they have a nice cluster of flowers but i'm not going to go and cut a bunch of those flowers it's not going to do as much for that plant they're not as prolific you know what i mean um, with my sand coreopsis and my coneflower they're huge and they produce, I think I have like 50 or 60 flowers on my Coreopsis plant right now. So when it's those kind of plants where they're really flowering like crazy, um, once the seed head starts to die, I actually just cut those back to a grow point. So a grow point on your plant is gonna be, you've got your stem and maybe another stem's coming out. So if this stem has a dead flower head on it, I'll cut it right here but I'll let this one keep growing. And so that can, that can uh, urge the plant to keep growing new flowers. But, it, but again, like I said, it, it doesn't work with all plants. So a good kind of way to think about that is if it is one that grows several, several flowers throughout the season, it's a good chance that you can keep cutting it and it's gonna keep growing. Um, but, like with our my vervain and my great blue lobelia that only has one stalk, I'm not going to cut that one. You know what I mean? So, um, so that's a good way to think about it. Um, but of course, if you have a question, you can reach out to me, and you can also I Google the heck out of everything. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, what? Well, oh, and as far as the seed collecting, that was your other question. Um, I'm really excited this year, we're gonna have a seed collecting workshop in the fall. We planted um, two native seed bank gardens in two different preserves in the township. And they're doing really well. We did one out at Davis Foster Preserve and one at Thai Heart. And uh, in the fall, um, if some of them are flowered, they might not be flowered this year. Um, we will go out and we'll have a workshop showing volunteers how to gather seeds, how to collect them, how to store them over the winter, and then what you would do with them in the spring. Um, the point of those seed bank gardens that we planted was so that we could make an investment and, like I said before, grow our own plants in the future. So I definitely want to get uh, the MCC involved in that and residents involved in that workshop so that we can. Uh, um, have that knowledge to keep propagating. <laughs> Great. Well, this is an open conversation. Um, so free ranging dialogue and or Q and A, whatever you'd like to do for the next 15 minutes. Um, any other observations or questions, suggestions? Emma, I do have a question in terms of you know, I live in a subdivision. So if I were to put, if I were to plant a lot of that stuff in, and it starts growing, um, am I going to look like I am abandoning my yard and it's just filled with weeds? Um, you know, because I'm, I'm the president of, the, of our association and I'm having to deal with that. And so I, I don't, I'm, I'm concerned about going in and doing that and planning all this stuff and then you know i'm i'm having to say to people you got to take care of your weeds am i going to be that do, am i going to look like that so i'm just curious what it looks like as it comes in and grows yeah i think that's a really big uh question and roadblock for a lot of people with um planting native um i think one of the most important things to think about is like for example i like a more wild look and I don't have neighbors who, um, you know, they don't care that I leave my lawn a little bit longer than theirs. You know, theirs is very manicured. I mow higher. Um, so I am lucky my neighborhood is, nobody is bothering me about that. Um, but you can have your garden look as manicured as you want. You know, you can, the great thing about um, like the native species I have is, like my, like I was saying, my coreopsis is getting really out of control and I just cut it, you know, just like you shape a shrub to look like something. You can really cut them back, 
Um, the ones that do get more out of control and maybe might look a little messier are going to be ones that you can really manicure more and keep them contained. Um, I mulch my garden too. That always makes it look really nice. It keeps the weeds down. It keeps the soil uh, wetter. Um, and so there is, and this is actually a good thing to bring up because I want to do make a list of plants that are very easy to maintain. Um, like right now I have a blazing star coming up and it's just a tubular flower that comes straight up and that's all it does for the year, but it's absolutely beautiful. So you can also pick and choose a species that is gonna be more contained. Um, there's wild petunia, which looks just like the petunias we get at the store, but it is a native species and it's a really nice ground cover. It keeps low. Um, so I think it really comes down to the planning and using very specific species to get that neater look. Um, when they're growing, they can look, because of our, because of the view we have of gardening and we want everything to have color all the time or we want it to be like grown right like that. Um, like right now, my New England Aster is, you know, up to my shoulder, but it doesn't have any flowers on it yet. So it's just a big green, <laughs> you know, almost looks like a shrub with how big it is. But once fall hits, it's gonna have a million beautiful purple flowers on it. So I think it depends, you know, on your view of it, on your neighborhood's view, um, because they can look a little weedy, some of the ones that are later bloomers, just because they don't bloom for a long time. So maybe you want one like any of the Coreopsises they flower all summer and they always have yellow flowers on them. So they're a really nice one because they just always have that presence. And even though they do get really big and kind of wild, they always have a flower or, you know, cone flowers are nice because they grow straight up. Um, Lobelia and spiderwort, same thing. They have really beautiful blue flowers um, and they're, they're pretty neat plants. Spiderwort can get a little crazy and crawly. Um, but yeah, it just, it just depends on, on which plants you're, you're choosing. So I would just be very mindful with how you go about it. Thank you. I would say about that, um, you know, we have our native plants, um, mulched and it, you know, it looks, it looks nice right now. I mean, it's the first year of them growing. So some of them aren't flowering yet, but we do have the wild petunia. We have you know, blue lobelia, we have the coreopsis, we have the coneflower, you know, which all look nice. And so I'm assuming second year will look a lot nicer, but I'm wondering if perhaps um, maybe for like the subdivision kind of look, maybe there perhaps, you know, there could be a list of plants for that. So, so it, it doesn't, you know, um, so it doesn't have, you know, the question that Sarah's asking is, uh, you know, uh, thought process that people have, you know, they're worried about that it's going to get out of control and look unmanicured and all of that kind of thing. So I'm wondering if we can make like a neighborhood kind of list of flowers perhaps or, or whatever that might assist with that process. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. From my understanding, the uh... Code enforcement folks are fairly tolerant if it looks like it's intentional and that well, you you mentioned manicured, you know, even if it's just a small edge of uh, grass that's mowed. Um, I found that in East Lansing, I keep the pathway between my invasive species mown. Uh, no, it's not all invasive species, but it looks that way sometimes. Probably mostly. <laughs> but just, just a little pathway makes it look tended to. Yeah, like mine is fenced in too. I have a very short fence because the bunnies are horrible. But now actually the deer have gotten to some of my plants on that they're taller. Um, but yeah, if you uh, are just, you know, really weeding it um, and mulching it. And then once it fills in though, it's gonna look so nice because everything's gonna be so thick. It's just gonna go together really well. And at that point too, you're barely gonna have to weed, which is really nice. Yeah, I, I have definitely been paying attention to yards that I can tell are very intentional. 
which is is really cool. We have a few that I've noticed in the neighborhood outside of our neighborhood that that are exciting to be able to see that stuff growing. Yeah, yeah, and being able to incorporate shrubs too, and kind of making everything layered in different heights can make it look really landscaped, but it's all native. Um, you know, like red buds and service berries too, bringing color into your art in the spring. I mean, those are just my favorite trees. They're so beautiful and they flower for so long. Um, so just having some different um, heights and everything too can, can make it look really, really sharp. We can also uh, stray from this topic if people have other things that they want to share for the next five minutes or reflections. Um, any other topics of interest? I did want to mention that uh, we it's possible that we might have uh, a gentleman from Granger, uh, Charles Hauser, who's available. He's not usually available on a Wednesday, but he happens to be available possibly next week to talk a little bit about uh, Granger, recycling, waste management. And um, if you're interested in having him next week uh, to kick off the conversation, um, I can I can confirm that with him. Anybody against that? Okay, I'll, I'll check in with him. Anything else for the good of the whole? I think I'm going to stop recording right now and uh,